on Newcastle today. Like a copy of God's Word, written Word of God, New Testament of the Bible. I'll say to you quite freely, without any cost or any obligation to you. If you'd like one, do uh, feel free to come and ask for one. Is that uh, the Word of God, and of course, proven, uh, demonstrated over many generations to be so, and those, of course, who uh, received the engrafted Word of God, that is, uh, find it to be exactly what it is, the Word of God, and able uh, to save their souls. If you'd like to have a copy of God's Word, as I say, it's offered to you quite freely. Yours simply and only for the taking. What of God for you here, Newcastle today, taken from the uh, Book of Romans, check it out for yourself. Romans chapter 9, where God says, Jacob, Jacob, have I loved Esau, have I hated? Comes a uh, a surprise to some people, you know, that there's hate with God, you know, that uh, he hates uh, workers of iniquity and uh, he hates those that shed innocent blood. The Bible says, you know, no, it's not a surprise really. I mean, we ought to hate evil, aren't we? You as well. So Jacob, have I loved Esau? Have I hated what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, it is not of him that willeth, who chooses, not of him that runneth, who works, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, he was the king of Egypt back in the day. Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore, have thee mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Yeah, it's a difficult uh, matter, I guess, for those well, who don't know and love God and who have not uh, received his engrafted word, who have not humbled themselves under his mighty hand, and being exalted by him, hard saying, I guess, you know, that the uh, truth of the Bible is that God, you know, because you hear it all the time, you know, from some uh, well-meaning, but, you know, somewhat ignorant uh, Christian people or religious people, you know, telling you all on a Sunday that God loves everybody and wants to save everybody. On the basis, of course, they take it from John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world. But of course, that doesn't mean all the world, all men, all mankind, head for head. Now, whosoever believeth shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The world of believers is uh, whom God loves. Now, you see, the fact, the truth, of the Bible is that God has predestined uh, pre, that's before before what? Before he made the human race, before he made the world, the universe, everything in it. God has predestined some uh, to be vessels of honor, that is to know and love him, serve him, and some to dishonor, some to be uh, vessels of wrath, and of course fitted for destruction. Not, uh, not an easy thing, you know, for uh, somebody outside of Jesus Christ on the wrong side of God 
and his salvation a difficult concept for them to say because we, we live with this notion, don't we, you know, human rights. Human rights, you know, it's a joke really, like, you know. Like we got human rights, we got rights to this and rights to that and rights to the other. <laughs> you got no rights to nothing, nothing at all. Only right you've got to the consequences of your sinful natures in which you are conceived and born and uh, the actions, you know, uh, that comes out of those sinful natures. So um, that God determines who will be saved, not you, not of him that will it, not of him that chooses, not your choice, but God's, and not of him that runs, not your work, but God's work, you see. It's God who determines who will be saved and who will be destroyed everlastingly. And of course, well, you know, straight away somebody raises the voice and says, well, why then does he find fault, you see? Seeking to contradict the will and the word of God, and it's rebellion, that's what it is, you know? Because he got this idea, you know, of the, some kind of a human right. That they've got a right, like, uh, you know, that they've got a right before God even, like, you know? Not, not at all, the very opposite is the case. Uh, who I ask you, and what, um, is man that he should reply against God, you know? Here you are, just a tiny little speck. God says this word, don't you know? that all the nations put together are like a drop in a bucket to him, you know? So what's one individual, I ask you? You know, to rail and reply against God and what he has revealed and what he has decided sovereignly to do? Here you are just a tiny little speck of sinful dust on the horizon of God's universe and you want to reply against God. Not a safe, not a good thing to do, rather the very opposite, resist the hardening influence in your heart and uh, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you in due season time. So man's uh, sinful nature and man's sinful practice swears, you know, it all comes out of, it's the fount, you know, the, the source, as it were, you know, of all the muck and filth, false religion, false philosophies of men, and so on. All the dire stuff in your world today, it's the outworking, it's the consequence of your having been conceived in sin in your mother's womb, and then nine months later born in sin live in sin, die in sin, and go to a lost eternity. Unless that is God has chosen you, God has selected you, elected you, made you to be a vessel of honor. Because that's not everybody. Some he has made vessels of dishonor, fitted for destruction, made for that purpose, the Bible says. So you see, my friends, that pushes out the window, this notion that God loves everybody, you know, and has a responsibility to everybody, to save everybody. Not the case at all. Not according to God's word, that is, anyway. So you see, uh, God, he's the potter, and, uh, you know, we're, we're the clay, yeah? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? The clay is the lump, you see, out of which God has made the human race. And out of that lump of clay, well, he's made some vessels of honor and some to dishonor. Some he's made to save and some he's made to destroy. But then, him being the potter, well, you know, that's his business, you know, he's every right to do that. So, that he makes some vessels of honor and some to dishonor, you know, like, uh, you know, you've got some objects of pottery in your house, I guess, most people do. Some of them, they're, they're nice, 
vessels, you know, and you put them up on your mantel shelf, put them in your cabinets to display so that people can marvel and wonder at them. Vessels of honor, you might call them. But you've got other vessels in your home that you put garbage in, you put filth in, that eventually, you know, are going to be thrown in the scrap heap because they're vessels of dishonor. Well, God, in like fashion, you see, when he made the human race out of that one lump of clay, or some he made for one purpose, to display his grace and his love and favor, and some, well, some he made to, um, to show his power in destroying them. Because he's the potter, you see. He's the potter. He's the one, you know, who makes the call. Not you, not I. You know, we are what we are. We are what God's made us. You know, and who are you to reply against God? You know, the potter. The potter does what he wants with the lump of clay, does he not? So you see, my friends, uh, the potter has the right to do whatever he pleases. You don't, but he does. So some vessels, of course, they're, they're marred and they're spoiled. And some of those, that sin, you know, sin came into the world, spoiled us all, so that God can say that we were all of us conceived in sin and born in sin, live and die in sin. Unless that is by the grace of God, the potter takes hold of us by his grace and remakes us. But he does that, you see, with those whom he has chosen, elected unto salvation. See, there was an election took place before the world was made, the universe was formed. There was an election took place. You weren't there, you didn't have a vote, none of us did. It was on God's part where he chose out of the human race that he would make some vessels to honor, some to dishonor. Some he made to save and some he made to destroy way before any one of us had done any good or any evil, before anyone had even a thought in their head. So some are remade, refashioned as it were, saved that is by the gospel, God sending his only begotten son into the world that through him that he might be saved, reconciled to God that is restored to the image of God, to the favor of God, made vessels unto honor. Vessels, that is, pleasing to God. New creations, you see, in Christ Jesus, brought by God, the will of God, the decree of God brought to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ through the preaching of the gospel, the hearing, of the word of God, of the good message of God's salvation, that by the grace of God brought to repent of their sin, turn from their sinful ways, not resist the will of God, not reply against God, but yield to God, submit to God, humble themselves under the mighty hand of God, and God takes them, and God remakes them, and God makes them vessels of honor. But that's not everybody. That's only those whom God has chosen from before the foundation of the world. But here's the surprising thing. Some God has made, the potter has made deliberately to dishonor. And he gives us an example here of the king of Egypt, the man called Pharaoh. He was a king back in the day, raised up by God and set apart by God to do the wickedness that he did to oppose God. But then, of course, that's the very reason for which he was raised. And, of course, all the ungodly and the wicked who hate God and hate his son, Jesus Christ, and resist the gospel, and resist, of course, um, well, resist Almighty God. Well, for the same reason, you see, for the same reason they were raised up, you see, they were given their being, they were given their status and their station and life in the world, you see, all the gifts and talents given to them, but they used them, you see, 
they use them deliberately to oppose God. Some prominent figures, you know, like Charlie Darwin, you know, and the, uh, the foolish uh, Professor Dawkins, you see. God gave him his station in life. He gave him the intellect, you know. He gave him the gifts and the talents to be what he is. But he raised them up and set them apart to wickedly, evilly oppose God, the knowledge of God, and of course, uh, well, to infect others too with his uh, godlessness. But he was raised for that purpose, you see. Fitted for destruction. God, the potter, you see, has deliberately made some vessels out of the same lump, the same human race. He's made some to honor, some to dishonor, some he's made deliberately in order to destroy them. And well, you'll know that, you see, if you resist the gospel, resist the overtures, the promises of God in the gospel that should you repent and believe the gospel, you would be saved. You resist, you remain, you're hardened. You see, the gospel has two influences. When it's proclaimed amongst you, it has a saving influence upon some, the vessels of honor, those whom God has chosen. It has a saving influence upon them. It draws them. It melts them and it draws them to Jesus Christ in order to be saved by his shed blood. But then, of course, there's another influence at work as the gospel is being proclaimed even here amongst you today. It's a hardening influence because God hardeneth whom he wills, the Bible says. Those vessels of dishonor those fitted for destruction, he uses the gospel to harden them. But of course, well, you have to ask yourself the question, well, do you resist the hardening influence? Do you say, no, I will not be hardened, I will not resist God, I will not reply against him, but I will yield myself to him, I'll submit myself to Jesus Christ, you say, no, I don't, and no, I won't. Well, then the gospel will just simply harden you. That's his influence, you see, upon the vessels, the ones that are fitted, God says, for destruction. That's their final, and that's their eternal state and destiny. It's in the hands of God, you see, not yours. Many, many people who live in your world today your modern society today, they think, you know, that they're the masters of their own destiny. The choice is with them. It's not of man that willeth, not your choice. Not of man that runneth, not your doing. My friends, it's God's doing. You're in the hands of the potter, like it or not. And you're his to do with as he will. And he will do his good pleasure, whatever that be. Oh, be assured of it, my friend. So, the lumps of clay, you see, the lumps of clay, the human race, that is, the lump of clay out of which God has made the human race, well, they have no rights at all. They have no complaints against the pocket at all. God starts with the lump of clay, and out of it, he makes the human race. And within that human race, he has made a distinction, you see. The seed of the woman, those who are vessels to honor, those whom he has chosen to salvation. And then there's the seed of the woman, those who belong uh, to the serpent, to, to the devil. Their father is the devil, and they do his will, and they do his lust. That's the distinction, you see, that God has made in the human race. The potter, he did with the lump of clay just as he pleased. And that's what he's done. Made some to honor and made some to dishonor. Fitted for destruction. Eternal, everlasting destruction, that is. Out of the same lump, the potter, he makes both. Some to save and some to damn. 
eternally, everlastingly, never to come to a knowledge of God, true righteousness, holiness, without which, of course, no man shall ever see God. So you see, my friends, this is told to us, this is uh, uh, your instruction for today, in order not that you should reply against God, not that you should seek to contradict Him, not that you should harden yourself or be hardened, but rather that you should hard, you should uh, resist the hardening influence and yield yourself, humble yourself, tremble at the very thought that you might be a vessel of dishonor, that you might have been chosen for uh, eternal destruction. Tremble at the very fact. Yield yourself to God. Humble yourself under His mighty hand that you might be exalted, that is, in due season, as God Himself pleases. So the power of the potter to do with as He wills, with the lump of clay, and with what He makes out of the lump of clay. The power to destroy. Here in verse 19, thou wilt say then unto me, why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Well, none can resist him. That's an impossibility. But that doesn't take away your responsibility. That you cannot resist the will of God. No, no, no. God's not the author of your sin. Man's the author of that and responsible for it. The very fact that you cannot come to Christ unless God has given you to Him before the foundation of the world. And unless God, through the preaching of the gospel, draws you to Jesus Christ, you cannot come to Him. The Savior Himself says so. So, you see, my friends, that apart, that does not, that does not excuse you, my friends. On the contrary, the very opposite. No responsible sin came into the world some people will argue well it didn't come by me it was my first parent it was adam he brought sin into the world and death came on the on the heels of it surely it did and you might say well i wasn't there i'm not responsible for what he did oh yes you are god says so the potter says so he has the authority, he's the power, not you, not I. And he says, my friends, that we are all responsible in Adam. Because he, you see, was the head of the human race. And he was your and my representative before God. And when he sinned, he sinned on your behalf and mine. The entirety of his posterity. He entered into a contract with sin that's binding upon every human being born into this world. So that God can truly say, you see, that we are all, every one of us, conceived in sin, born in sin, and live and die in sin, but for the grace, the kindness of God, you see? So, you know, this does not take away just because the potter makes what he wants out of the lump of clay, vessels to honor and vessels to dishonor well i didn't make myself that way you say not my responsibility yes it is says god totally responsible and accountable for your sins my friend for adam's sin and for the sinful nature that you have inherited from him and my friend all the sinful practice that comes comes out of that sinful nature in which you are conceived and which you are born. Totally responsible. And then, of course, you see, well, the evidence is here, you know. Sinners never, never resist the hardening influence. Even when the gospel, even when the overtures of God's love are declared amongst you, even when the promise is declared, even when the call of the gospel comes to you, repent and believe the gospel in order that you might enter God's kingdom, there's a hardening influence at work 
but the sinner never, never resists it. Why don't you resist it? Why don't you resist it? If you're to reply against God, if you get an argument with God, if you would contradict God, well, my friends, resist the hardening influence. Because anybody who says, I will not be a vessel of honor, I will, I, I will, I will resist the hardening influence. Oh, such a person would be a, a vessel of honor, would be saved, my friend. But you just go with the flow. You just go with your sinful nature. You just go with the rest of the human race, my friend. The gospel is preached amongst you. What do you do? You rail against the preacher. You rail against God, against his word. You rail against his Christ. You rail, rail against the one who would save you. So you see, my friends, no argument, none whatsoever. You know, uh, you say, I wish I were a child of God and not a child of wrath. I wish, I wish, I, I wish I was a vessel of honor. I wish, I, I wish with all my heart, I, I, I was not, I was not suited for destruction. You wish you desired that with all your heart. You will be, you will be a vessel of honor, not dishonor. But sinners, never, never struggle against what God has made them. If he's made you a vessel to dishonor, fitted for destruction, you never, never, never struggle against it. Not because God's stronger than you. Not because of that he is, but that's not the reason. The reason is because your nature's corrupted conceived in sin, born in sin, live in sin. You can't do any other. It comes out of you naturally. Again, I say to you, I've said to you many times before, can you change the spots on a leopard? No, you say, that's his natural condition. That's how it was made. It can't be any other. It would take a miracle to change it. Can you make a black man white, a white man black? No, you see, that's the way we were made. It would take a miracle to change that. Well, says God, how can you, who are accustomed to doing evil, made to do evil, made to do wickedness, how, how can you do good? How can you resist it, my friend? It's your corrupt nature. And yes, yes, it would take a miracle to change that. The miracle of God's grace. The miracle of regeneration. He must be born again, says Jesus. Except a man be born again, cannot see the kingdom of God. So unless, you see, you resist the hardening influence, unless you refuse to be hardened in your sin, in your heart, in the wickedness, in which you are conceived and born, unless you resist it, my friend. And you will only do that by the grace of God. You will only do that if God has chosen you, has predestined you unto salvation, my friend. Only then will you do such a thing. So the nature's corrupted, you see. But God also has the power authority that is the right as he so pleases to show mercy sovereignly as he chooses as he pleases but again to some not to everybody I mean even experience tells you that huh? I mean how many people out of your own society are saved are genuine reborn Christians who love God and who love his word, the Bible, and stand by and upon it. How many do you know? Huh? I'll bet you couldn't even count them on one hand. No, no, my friends, we're always in the minority. No problem there. God's tiny flock. No, no, you see, my friends, the problem is, the problem is, the majority, the masses, 
are not chosen to salvation, are chosen to be vessels of dishonor. God's flock is always, always a tiny flock. Not all, my friends. Experience alone tells you that. Many, many thousands, millions over past generations have gone out of this world. Their hearts, their natures never changed, never born again, never come to a knowledge of God, of his love, of his mercy and kindness, but gone out of the world, lost, suited for destruction. Few there be, few there be that are saved. And in this wicked generation in which you find yourself today, my friends, I tell you even fewer, even fewer, my friends. But God, God will have his people in every day and generation. They are mine. I made them for that purpose and I shall have them. Some, my friends, but not all. So again, would you reply against God, says the apostle? Would you contradict him? Would you rebel against him? Well, that, my friends, is to yield yourself to the hardening influence. You rebel against God to your own destruction. You're faced with a precipice, my friends. And you're in your car, yeah? And you've got petrol in the car. It's good petrol, nothing wrong with the petrol. And you've got a choice to make. You put your foot on the gas, on the petrol, and you go over to destruction. Or you hit the brake and you stop yourself going over the precipice. Which choice will you make? Well, I'll tell you, my friend, well, God tells you, you'll put your foot on the gas, on the petrol. You'll destroy yourself, my friend. You'll destroy yourself. The only time any person, anyone, will put their foot on the brake is by the sovereign mercy of God imparted to them. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. God says, he's the potter, man, not you. He's God, not you. Right in the beginning, the first temptation that came to your first parent and mine, Adam, Satan, the devil, the old serpent said to him, eat the damn fruit, Adam. Eat the damn fruit, man. Then you'll be as God. And ever since men and women have lived in God's world, thinking that they're God, they're the masters of their own destiny, they call the shots. No, says God. No, says God, you do not. I am the daughter. You are the clay. And I do with my clay just as I please. So don't contradict. Don't reply against God. Don't rebel against Him. Don't yield to the hardening influence. But rather yield, my friend, yourself to Jesus Christ. Submit a white flag raised in surrender to the Almighty Son of God that He might save you. A tiny speck of sinful dust, I ask you. Tiny speck of sinful dust, filthy, unclean dust on the horizon of God's universe and you want to reply against them? You want to contradict them? You want to argue with them? Only one end to that, my friends. Only one end to that. Fitted for destruction. So you see, my friends, God is God. And this is the one aspect in the Bible. Hated by men and women, it makes them gnash their teeth. Even Christians gnash their teeth at it, they hate it. It's the least liked and read chapter in all the Bible. Read it for yourself, Romans chapter 9. And see, my friends, the one thing that makes God to be God and man just a silly, silly, simple speck of dust. Yeah, God is God. He's the potter. You're the clay. Question is, left to you. Has he made you to be a vessel of honor or a 
a vessel of dishonor fitted for destruction. Which is it? Which is it, I ask you? So I urge you again, strive. Strive against the hardening influence. It's abroad in your society today, don't you know? Widespread in your society in this generation. Can you not see the madness? Is it not evident to you? Is it not obvious to you? And those of you who can see it, you're cowed into silence. You're frightened to speak out against them. These monsters that harden themselves against God, the inventors of your LGBT mob, transgenders and the like, it's madness and most reasonable people know it. But they won't speak out. They're frightened. They're fearful. They're cowed. Cowed into a fearful silence. Why would they be scared? Against. Against their reason. Against their reason because of what they're threatened with. You know? Use that noddle. Yeah? So I urge you, my friends, strive against the hardening influence. It's abroad in your society today, my friends. It's running wild. And it's a generation, I tell you, fitted for destruction. Few there be, few, my friends, there be that are saved. Always few, always few. Strive, says Jesus, to enter in at the straight gate. It's not a wide gate. It's a narrow gate. It's a narrow pathway that leads to life, eternal, everlasting life. There's the white gate. There's the broad You shouldn't hate two them. Evils. They're murderers. What? what if it's the lesser of two evils? Well, what's, what, what's the greater he, what's the, what's When I was born with my mother, I almost killed her coming out. Did you? Yes. So? I almost killed my mum coming out. That's not if she chose, abortion. If she had chose to get rid of me to save her own life, I wouldn't have looked down from wherever I went that's and not, said, I hate her for that. You were looking up. Um, that's no excuse for abortion. That's no excuse. And what about there's the three no, things that God is supposed to be? There's no excuse for abortion. Omniscience, omnibenevolence, yep, omnibenevolence, and omnipotence. All more. He's all so God more. loves everyone. He's the potter, you're the clay, and you're replying against him. You're hardening your heart, sir. And I'm you're not. being hardened. You're being hardened by God, Christian. even as we speak. I was, I was raised to love everyone. No, no, no. No, 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 no. God does not, and neither do I. I've adopted two of them. I've adopted two of them. Okay? So my friends, you know, get rid of the notion that God loves everybody and his intention is to save everybody. That's not the gospel, my friend. That's not the gospel. There are vessels to honor and vessels to dishonor. God hardens whom he wills and God saves who he wills. He's the potter. You're the clay. Jesus says, enter ye in at the street gate. The narrow pathway that leads to life. The wide one leads to everlasting, eternal destruction. Yield yourself to King Jesus, to the Son of God. Repent and believe the gospel. For the kingdom of God is at hand. And that's the only way you enter into it. Repent ye and believe the gospel. That is the most loving thing that any person in this world today could tell you. 
Repent ye and believe the gospel. Repent ye and believe the gospel. You like a copy of God's word? Read for yourself, examine. Read the pages of the Bible for yourself. See what God the Lord would say to you. See whether you be a vessel of honor or dishonor. Whether you be fitted for destruction or for everlasting and eternal life in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You'd like a copy of God's Word, you come and ask for one. May God bless you and have mercy, Newcastle, upon your precious, precious, never dying soul. Want a copy of God's Word? You come and ask for it. Panther. I think God is. So am I. What about those poor women who That's no excuse. Murdered the child because the, because the mother was raped. One one crime one crime solves another one. Get on, man. Get on. You've been reading the wrong one then. Probably. Probably the Pope's. Probably the Pope's. Well, read for yourself and see, sir. I've just told I you what read. I've just told you what it says. I have read. Uh, I don't believe you. At home, at this very moment, I yeah. have got four Bibles. Yeah, yeah, the devil's got them as well. <laughs> <laughs>